Within League of Legends' very colorful cast of champions, their roster of over 150 often gets divided into a bunch of categories, such as fighters, assassins, etc. Throughout all of them, Riot tends to make more of certain classes than others, understandably so. The popular ones get a lot more coverage every now and then, but I think it's worth giving attention to the not-so-recognized ones. I mean, I have an entire series talking about unpopular champions, but that's not what I mean here. There's one group in particular that I wanted to give special attention to, because they not only make up a subclass, but a playstyle in totality. Poke Champions. Poke in League of Legends is dishing out damage consistently in the neutral without too much commitment, and generally, all poke comes in the form of skill shots, since for obvious reasons, it wouldn't be good game design to allow someone to attack you from a full screen away with no way to dodge it. There's a good number of champions in the game with ranged attacks, so it might be a bit confusing to figure out what constitutes a poke ability. Theoretically, any attack might be mistaken as poke, even melee attacks. For instance, let's say in top lane, we have Yasuo vs Jax. Every time Jax walks up to last hit minions, Yasuo can use Q for some quick poke damage. Same can be said for other champions like Viego, Jarvan, or Mordekaiser who have attacks that can strike through minions. So I need to make a clarification that there's a difference between harass and poke. The League Wiki has a really awesome section that covers all terminology and semantics that the community uses in-game, so I'll use their definition. Harass entails attacking an enemy while they are preoccupied with an action, which is the Yasuo and Jax example I described earlier. Scroll further down and you'll see Poke, a form of harass which uses long-ranged attacks to cause small or moderate damage in order to weaken an enemy while keeping a safe position. Technically, those two are interchangeable since the end goal is still the same. Anyways, if we go into the bot lane, Janna's Zephyr or Soraka's Star Call can count as Poke damage or even Bronze Winter's Bite. In the laning phase, just about any damaging ability that can hurt your lane opponent without committing to an all-in counts as poke or harass. But the ones I want to talk about in particular are champions specifically designed to do so, those dedicated long-range attackers. I think it's safe to say that just about every player has a guilty pleasure of playing poke champions, though they'll never admit it. They're pretty much the strongest subgroup in ARAM since recalling is impossible, and it can feel really devious being able to snipe someone from afar while they can't do anything to retaliate. That being said, the number of poke champions in League of Legends is few and far between, and they seldom ever rise to the top of the meta on any occasion. We're going to be talking about why that's the case by breaking down their playstyle, their role in the team composition, and their noteworthy flaws. First things first, who qualifies as a poke champion? I would say the easiest place to start is to look at mages. There actually is a subclass dedicated towards poke champions, but there are only three of them. Artillery mages. Vel'Koz, Zerath, and Ziggs are the only ones who truly fit the mold of an artillery mage, who usually do magic damage. But as you can see here, Jace, Lux, and Varus are also considered part of it, although they tend to be known for dual maining two subclasses. Jace can be a diver, Lux can be a burst mage, and Varus naturally is a marksman. A couple other champions I think that can also have poke as a playstyle are Zoe, Ezreal, Nidalee, Heimerdinger, Sivir, Corky, and Talia. Although Talia and Heimerdinger prioritize zone control more than long-range chip damage. Again, most of these champions aren't known for sniping you across the screen, but they do have a very strong neutral game and have an ability or two that covers a decent range. Poke champions carry immense pressure, especially when ahead. Since they have the longest effective range in the game, they can make it extremely dangerous for the enemy team to even take a step forward, let alone try to go for a fight. They're the strongest when it comes to playing neutral, such as dancing around an objective, trying to look for an opening to start a fight, or pushing lanes in an effort to siege towers. They also have a pretty solid advantage state, such as if the enemy team is on the retreat. Zerath, in particular, is fantastic at sniping down low health targets with a semi-global ultimate, and Ziggs can use Mega Infernal Bomb to block off their escape route. Also, despite their weakness towards being engaged on poke, champions don't have that bad of a disadvantage state either, since their abilities can be used as cover fire to stop or at least slow down enemy pursuit. All in all, they have pretty solid gameplay and can be really effective for players who are good at landing skill shots. So why are poke champions becoming less and less common? And to add on to that, why are there so few concentrated poke champions in League of Legends? Let's answer the second one first, since that one's quicker. Generally speaking, it's difficult to design poke champions without them all turning out or looking the same. No matter how they apply it, in the end, it's just long-range skill shots. Back to the Super Smash Bros. example, zoners like Samus, Duck Hunt, Mega Man, DDD, the Belmonts, the Lynx, they all just throw stuff at you. There's only so many different types of bombs, arrows, lasers, missiles you can make. Now, I understand there's a huge meme with the Fire Emblem characters, but you get the idea. In League of Legends, a ton of Qs consist of forward thrust attacks. Jarvan's Dragon Strike, Mordekaiser's Obliterate, Pantheon's Comet Spear, Pike's Melee Bone Skewer, Rel's Shattering Strike, Viego's Blade of the Ruined King, Yasuo's Steel Tempest, and Yone's Mortal Steel. 
All seven of these champions have all seven of these champions have a forward strike for their basic ability, yet they have vastly different playstyles because their Q is mostly just meant for damage. Poke champions need to have their entire kits designed around long-ranged attacks, so while the former group only needs one, these guys need to have all three of their abilities to be mid to long-ranged attacks, and obviously to keep it balanced, they have to usually be skill shots with narrow or tight hitboxes. It'd be kinda disgusting if they had a Darius Q hitbox with 1500 range. As for why they're not as common, it's a bit more complicated. Poke champions have a tendency to lack satisfying or flexible gameplay, in that most of the time it just comes down to you slinging projectile after projectile on the enemy team over and over again. It's fun every now and then, but poke champions are more macro-oriented, so they're not the most exciting. In my episode on why no one plays Vel'Koz, I talked about how his core gameplay is that of a tactician, setting up the map like on a chessboard, and enabling his team to push forward or retreat backward with his zone control and damage. However, while poke champions have some of the best neutral game out of any champion, they can't really break out of it. There's a rock paper scissors triangle in League of Legends for poke, sustain, and engage. Poke damage beats engage because you can't safely engage when you're being pressed down by heavy fire, engage beats sustain because you can't heal up if you get bursted in one shot, and sustain beats poke because they can heal up any damage they take. Poke champions can wear down the enemy team, but they can't quite kill that consistently, they're not fast enough. If their opponents get low, they can just back off and recall. This is specifically why they're 10 times better in ARAM because you can't recall to heal off any damage you took. The usual goal of a poke mage is to damage the enemy team enough to the point where they can't respond to whatever you're doing, sieging towers and inhibs or taking objectives, what have you. That's a good thing, right? It is. Except there was no explosive teamfight 1v5 pentakill or anything. Just you slowly but surely bleeding out the enemy team. Case in point, it's boring to a lot of players. Poke champions do hella damage, but they don't have the same kind of kill factor you see on fighters and slayers. Playing a war of attrition is just boring because it takes too long. Even if a fight breaks out, you can still only really do poke damage. Vel'Koz does have a relatively consistent and satisfying burst combo, but he still has to play far back and keep chucking out Qs and Ws. You aren't able to switch gears from a poke champion to an all-in rushdown, and obviously players like the characters that go in. It's not just League of Legends, but in all games. There are far more people who enjoy PvPing up close and personal than just shooting each other from afar. Aside from player mentality, a lot of things in the game have made these champions pretty risky to play, and these changes straight up broke the poke sustain engage triangle. On one end of the equation, it's become way too easy to fight back against poke damage. If you have a healing or shielding support on your team like Soraka, Sona, or Yumi, they can effortlessly regenerate and mitigate any damage your team suffers almost single-handedly. Even shield supports like Lulu and Janna make it much more difficult to do your job because they have a big shield on like a 3 second cooldown that gives a second shield on top of it, remember, summon Airy or Guardian. Also, there's a lot more access to healing and sustain these days. Legend Bloodline, Ravenous Hunter, Second Wind, Immortal Shield Bow, stuff like that. Prior to the item reworks in Season 11, and more specifically prior to Season 5, Building Lifesteal was a trade-off because items like Ravenous Hydra and Bloodthirster provided no critical strike chance, no cooldown reduction, no other stat. Support items also never gave heal and shield power, so healing and shielding was a lot weaker back then. This also might sound dumb, but Honey Fruits. The Honey Fruits that spawn in the river heal you for like a quarter of your health if you pick up all five. Those weren't there either. Riot had to nerf so many sustain items in Season 11 because people were healing back to full HP from like 0 in 2 seconds, but even nowadays, the game has vastly more healing and shielding. I remember talking to a few people, and also a couple comments you guys posted in my videos, that it's kind of interesting that the only anti-shield item is Serpent's Fang. My guess is because there are more ranged AP champions than there are melee, and to be kind of broken to have a long range shield breaker, but you know, I guess it's just something that I thought about. On the other end of the equation, ordinarily, Poke is supposed to beat Engage, right? If you keep pressuring the enemy team, they'll be too discouraged to make a move. Nope, they usually just don't care and will go in anyway. Because of how Engage heavy this game has gotten, Poke has lost a lot of viability over the years. Season 11 exacerbated this because there are so many more items in the game that give movement speed now. I say this even after we just got a huge nerf to mobility across all items last patch. Additionally, all champion classes have just gotten faster, even the subclasses who usually aren't supposed to be. Juggernauts and most mages were supposed to be slow and plodding, champions with really strong combat pressure but low range and or speed. Thing is, now you see Darius with Deadman's Plate, Nimbus Cloak, and Ghost, Volibear with his Q and Ultimate, Vladimir with Protobelt, Ghost, and Face Rush, Zoe can snipe you from a full screen away, sometimes being able to beat out LeBlanc who's all about that kind of stuff. Even tanks! Vanguards have always been able to get into fights, but they can do it a lot more effectively. Nunu and Ramis can bowling ball right into the enemy team from two screens away due to how fast they can move. 
Champions like Leona and Alistar make great use of Hexflash, allowing them to sneak over walls that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. And we have Orn, whose ultimate has a max cast range of over 2,500 units. Supports have this as well. Bard's Tempered Fate is semi-global, which is why he's so good at stopping Jin, Vel'Koz, and Xerath since he can interrupt their channel instantly. Rakan can dash to his allies and then use the Quickness and Grand Entrance to instantly reach the backline. It's so easy nowadays to just face plant right into a teamfight with some of these champions. When a skirmish or a teamfight occurs, poke champions typically stay far away from the action because the last place they want to be is smack dab in the middle of it. But that means they're out of position, which is, you know, exactly what the enemy Kha'Zix Rangar or Shaco wants. Essentially, poke champions are good at securing objectives, sieging enemy towers, and providing cover fire to deter enemy engage. But uh, you know what else does all three of those jobs? Killing the enemy team. That is the problem with the way MOBAs work. Even though game knowledge and macro play is 99% of the game and is magnitudes more important than mechanics no matter how much the Riven One Tricks try to tell you otherwise, 99% of the time it also gets thrown out the window because if the enemy team is dead, none of that matters. Vision control? You don't need vision control when the enemy team is dead. Wave management? You don't need wave management when the enemy team is dead. Objective control? You don't need objective control when the enemy team is dead. That mentality of you being able to just abandon everything and do what you want if the enemy team is dead annoys me so much because that's why in solo queue everyone is so focused on getting kills and ignores everything else. That's why your 0 and 10 vein still keeps building full damage because you don't need defense if you kill the enemy team. Then they continue to hard feed because the enemy team has even more damage than she does. But there is a design problem with poke champions that I think goes unnoticed. They can never become strong. In every game, long-range attackers are usually made very weak to balance out their incredible reach, but those weaknesses overcompensate for the character or class's strength almost all the time. In Smash Bros, a common weakness among Samus, the Belmonts, the Lynx, and such is their below-average frame data and horrible physics. That's why you never see them in top tier. At best, they're in high tier, but none of them ever get into the top 10. That's because if you give them the same movement and mobility as aggressive rushdown characters, they will be the best class in the game. This echoes throughout every combat-based game, even Minecraft. Bows output really strong damage and can travel very far. If you're accurate, you can kill off any player before they even get within reach of you. But when pulling your bow back, your movement slows down drastically because you need to charge your arrow, whereas when attacking with a sword, you have much better movement, DPS, and strafing capabilities. The Fire Emblem franchise has long-range magic known as Siege Tomes, and they're widely hated among the Fire Emblem community because of how dangerous they are given their coverage. But to offset that, they cannot be used in close range and are usually super heavy, so they slow down the wielder's attack speed. Long range damage is inherently a busted mechanic because you cannot counter it with close range. That's why snipers in real life are so insanely dangerous in the military. They can literally one-shot you from hundreds of meters away. The normal ways to counter snipers are with air support, artillery support, or most commonly other snipers. Infantrymen can't really stop a sniper since they're usually too far away and most likely don't know where they are. League of Legends has so few poke champions and those poke champions are never allowed to be top tier because the moment they do, they become the best champions in the game bar none. Yes, the main weakness of long range attackers is that if you get too close to them, you win. That's why Ziggs, Xerath, and Vel'Koz are easy targets for assassins or divers because they're squishy and no matter how strong they become, they're never really able to nuke you 100 to 0 like burst mages or assassins can. If they could, they'd be broken. Anyways, that's everything I have to say about poke champions. They're a dying archetype for sure, but at the same time, they were never, like, alive to begin with, if that makes sense. I think there are cases where it would be nice for them to get a bit more love, but that's doubtworthy considering poke meta is probably the only meta worse than tank meta for many players. If you enjoyed the video, a rating would be much appreciated, and don't forget to sub to the channel for more content like this. Consider following me on my socials and joining my Discord server if you'd like. Finally, if you have some extra time, please check out my discussion videos if you haven't yet. But thanks so much for watching, and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Take care.